Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's briefing on poverty and the impact of COVID-19. This webinar is part of a series hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. The National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty is a collaborative of funders, Jewish federations, direct service providers, researchers, media outlets, and advocates dedicated to fighting poverty in the American Jewish community. This is the last of these summer briefings. I believe this is number seven, and we're so happy that so many of you, uh, so many of you, have joined us throughout this summer to come and learn. Um, but please look out for more information in the coming weeks about some exciting opportunities to learn and share with each other in the early fall. During all these briefings, we discuss the many challenges that the coronavirus pandemic has created for the for the Jews facing poverty and for the agencies that serve them. And we have heard from, about the needs from the service providers on the ground supporting our front lines, shared best practices and information, and strategize on ways to respond collectively. And today we will focus on how poverty can impact access to higher education and educational success. I will now hear, hand it over to a moderator for these conversations, Susan Ditkoff of the Bridgman Group Boston, who will frame the conversation and introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Tamar, and welcome to everyone. Um, thank you to the Jewish Funders Network and the Poverty Affinity Group for hosting this webinar series. Uh, my name is Susan Wolf-Ditkoff. I'm a senior advisor at the Bridgespan Group. And um, before we start, I want to take a moment to acknowledge two things. One is that the Zoom network um, is apparently having some trouble today with the hurricanes and everything. So um, if we experience intermittent <clears throat> challenges, we will do our very best. Um, and so sort of more substantively, I just want to acknowledge that right now in our country and in our lives, many of our lives, there's a lot of uncertainty, um, a lot of trepidation about the months ahead. And so I just wanted to offer a reminder um, to take a moment to breathe deeply, conserve your strength um, if you need it, uh, to keep your own oxygen mask on um, while helping others before helping others. Um, so our focus today is higher education, as Tamar said, and we're asking how poverty impacts access to higher education success and um, you know, some of the myths, some of there are a lot of uh, misperceptions and myths around poverty among Jewish college students and what's happening on the ground. So um, we are very fortunate to have um, three experts um, giving us their perspectives. Um, Sarah Fortman, who is the director of the Jeffrey and Sherry Aronson Family Foundation in New York. Um, she's involved in a wide variety of partnerships in the post-secondary space in New York, and we look forward to hearing about those. Danielle Elman, who is the CEO of Common Point Queens, which is an organization aimed at improving the quality of communal life in Queens, New York. Um, fun fact, um, apparently Common Point Queens, if, if Google is correct, um, served something like 60,000 meals to nearly 25,000 households in less than two months at the beginning of this crisis. So just kudos to you, Danielle, and your team for um, just doing an incredibly sp swinging into action in a, a variety of ways. And we're looking forward to hearing how you connect with more than 8,000 high school students um, on your portal. Um, and, and, and we're excited to hear uh, sort of what, what things are changing um, from your perspective. And Adam Collett, who's executive director of Hillel, um, Broward and Palm Beach, who um, Adam had a long, has had many careers. Um, he joined Hillel in 2016. He spent seven years uh, before that at the Miami Federation. He was in the IDF. He has a whole variety of things um, and experiences which he will, which he'll bring to us. So just by way of introduction, I thought I'd say a couple things. You know, first that um, you know, there are many stereotypes about what a 20-year-old Jewish college student's life is like. Um, so just as a brief thought experiment, if you'll if you'll indulge, um, we just really wanted to try to paint a picture of, of what, the, what that is. So, um, so let's assume we're pre-COVID, not, not in the current moment when campuses were open and just to make it simpler, but, um, but close your eyes for a minute and picture a 20 year old Jewish college student. So what's, what is the campus that they're on? What does that look like? Um, where do they live? What are their housing arrangements? Um, what do they eat? How many hours a week are they in class? And what do they do when they're not in class? Whether they're part-time, full-time, what do they do when they're not in class? What kind of 
leisure or extracurricular or other activities that they're doing. Um, what do they do um, when they are thinking about job prospects? What are their, the options that they're considering? Um, what is their race, their gender? Uh, think about their families. Are they first generation college goers or are they legacy at institutions? Um, are they first generation Americans? Um, so it may surprise you to know that for many Jewish college students in the US, they may not look like the stereotypical vision that might be popping into some of your minds and you can open your eyes if, if they're still closed um, or you can just take a rest really um, we all need rest um, so but today we will break through some of those stereotypes and paint a picture of some of the students who are overlooked um, by the mainstream dialogue um, they're I, I, I hesitate to call them invisible they are very very visible um, but they are not as visible um, as they should be to the mainstream dialogue um, and their needs are very real and we're, we're hoping to talk about about those um, as they change by the day. So in the post-secondary education space, many of you know that Jewish college students are battling food insecurity, housing insecurity, other barriers of poverty um, to their success. They may have multiple jobs. They may be paying not only for their own classes, but contributing to their household income. They may be a primary caregiver for a younger sibling or niece or nephew or a child. They may be the family's main translator if English isn't the parent's first language. And all of this was, was pre-COVID. Um, and now we're sort of in a, in, a, in a COVID world where these challenges are magnified. So let me start um, with you, Sarah, if we can um, just give us your perspective about some of the, the myths um, that you encounter among maybe the more affluent um, members of, of the Jewish world about what's going on um, in this space. Um, tell us a little bit about these students tell us about their challenges and what's working and um and we look we look forward to hearing your your nuggets and observations that sounds great thank you thank you so much susan let me know if you have any uh, problems hearing me so appreciate you setting this stage and thank you tomorrow jsn um danielle and adam uh, and others for joining us today um it's really uh, a pleasure for me to be here representing as susan said uh, the aronson family foundation based in new york um, to share the funder perspective and more importantly for us really to represent a family and a team that cares deeply uh, about educational equity and jewish communities um, that especially here in new york city and so you know, to set the stage, I thought what might be helpful just to provide this funder perspective would to give you a little bit of a sense of um, how the Aronson Foundation's funding strategy has evolved as of late. And I'll start by saying that we, like probably many of those uh, folks on this call, invest in higher education institution. Re reason being, you know, that we all believe in the power of education as a key lever for upward mobility. And we know that a college degree is really the way that you can get a strong pathway out of poverty. And we know it has a significant impact on lifetime earnings and ability to learn to secure a living wage job and ultimately track into a into a career pathway. And so if, if Sherry were presenting here, and I know she is on this call, um, I know she would say how her children had every she had they had every um, opportunity as young people. They had educational supports, they had access to strong competitive universities, they had networks to lean on uh, for career guidance and for internships, and they acknowledge that this really is a tremendous privilege. And so knowing that, they have chosen to dedicate a significant amount of their time in the family's philanthropic resources to leveling the playing field for others through scholarship, through paid internships and experiential learning opportunities. And I would say much of their funding early on really was dedicated to a handful of some of the elite colleges and universities where the family had ties. And in these schools, there are certainly students who are experiencing challenges with financial need. But I think what we see there is that there really are a lot of resources on these campuses, both within career services, within other support services, and among these families to navigate their post-secondary experience. And simultaneously, we were investing in a number of community-based organizations throughout New York City, and those are really supporting students who face significant barriers to post-secondary success because of their socioeconomic status, their race, their zip code, language challenges. And these students were remarkable. I mean, they were brilliant, they were talented, they were driven, they were resilient, they were hungry, and almost all of them were landing at CUNY. 
the City University of New York. And so for those of you who might not be aware, I just want to give you a few stats about CUNY. Um, so it's a network of 25 public colleges uh, located throughout the five boroughs in New York, and it serves over 500,000 degree seekers and those pursuing continuing education in the city. It's a mix of two-year and four-year schools. And what's wonderful about CUNY among many things is that it's accessible and it's affordable um, to a lot of families. And so, you know, when you look at the profile of CUNY students, um, almost 42% are first generation college goers, 58% are Pell Grant recipients. So that means their total family income is $50,000 or less, but in most cases it's really around $20,000 or less. There are 161 languages spoken, and for students, 37% English is not their first language. And so as we dug a little deeper with CUNY, we soon realized that there's a significant Jewish population there. So estimates show it's around 14,000 students that we have found that are attending one of seven CUNY schools. And the reason why I went through the CUNY stats is because these, these Jewish students are experiencing the same challenges because they are, in many cases, first generation working class students because they, they really are one and the same. You know, the foundation, um, both trustees and staff then took a number of visits to visit um, to a number of these campuses. Um, you know, it was, we had the help of our, our friends and colleagues through Hillel, which we are extremely grateful for. for. And what we did not see is what I think Susan was alluding to at the at the intro there, which is we were not seeing loads of white Ashkenazi Jews that were coming from a place of privilege and attending a residential college. Instead, we were sort of ushered through the hallways. We were crammed into very small rooms that both doubled as offices for the two, maybe three staff members, um, and then program space. There were students coming in and out, it was not, you know, sitting in, a, in an expansive conference room having a discussion. And these students were really, they were, they really represented the vibrant multiracial and ethnic backgrounds of the global Jewish population. It, it was really remarkable. You had Mizrahi Jews, Bukharian Jews, Sephardic Jews, Ashkenazi Jews. They were altered Orthodox, modern Orthodox, secular. They spoke English, they spoke Yiddish, Farsi. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. And when we went around the room and we asked students where they were from, we heard Ukraine, Syria, Lebanon, Morocco, South Africa, Russia, Israel, Romania. And again, many of them did say that they're first generation college students. And so, you know, when we asked, when we went around the circle and we asked students to tell us a little bit about their lives and their routine, these are some of the themes that we heard over and over again. I live at home with my parents as or a caregiver and extended family members. You know, one student saying I was accepted to Yale, but I couldn't leave my family. Um, I commute to campus after I get my siblings ready in the morning and feed them breakfast and drop them off at school. I come to campus, I attend my courses. In between courses, I'll spend time in my car, for example, for a student in Staten Island. I'll go to the Hillel Lounge or another place on campus. I'll try to drop into a program, I might grab a bagel and I'll linger. Uh, if, if there are leftovers from the program, I might take those home with me discreetly so that I have something to eat when I make my way to work after school. These students go then off into a part-time or a full-time job, work for several hours, head home, help with dinner, bedtime, younger siblings, and then they begin their homework and are often in bed by midnight or 1 a.m. and start it all over again the next day. And so it shouldn't, so knowing this, uh, it shouldn't surprise you that these students are navigating a very high level of stress on a good day. They're managing this commute. I mean, again, not so much now in terms of COVID, but prior, students were commuting up to an hour and a half uh, each way to school. There's a lot of pressure for them to perform academically as first generation students. They need to contribute to the management of the household. Um, and in many cases, again, they are working to support both themselves and, and their students more broadly. You know, UJA study said that, you know, 66% of all CUNY Hillel students were working throughout the semester. And I'll also say that, you know, finding the space to explore someone's identity and interest, which is something I think I valued my college experience for tremendously. It, it's just, it's not something that these students are able to do. Uh, and in terms of managing mental health, um, because there are all these stressors on these students, I mean, there really are very limited um, there are limited resources on campus. There's major stigma attached to seeking help. Um, and again, there's limited income to, to 
address these issues privately. And so I think what we have found is that staff at these CUNY Hillels just play such an important role in supporting these students. They have deep knowledge. They know when things are remiss and they can really step in uh, and support students even if they're unable to articulate it. And I would say now, you know, fast forward to where we are today, you know, you layer in a global pandemic and a broader reckoning around social um, and racial justice. And I mean, I, it's, it's clear, I think, to everyone on this call that it's really exacerbated the, the racial and economic equality in this country. I mean, the heightened needs that we saw prior to COVID and all of this happening are, are just, we're seeing new ones. And as I said, they're really exacerbating existing ones. There's greater economic security as, as students have lost their jobs, their parents have lost their jobs. And we know if we have job loss in the home, their ability to maintain safe and affordable housing is at risk, especially with you know, the pause on eviction proceedings, which is gonna expire in New York City um, this week. And I think you know it's, it's just proving very difficult for families to continue to address the basic needs that they have, including food for the household, um, you know, cost of basic needs are rising much hard, much faster uh, than earnings rates at this point. And, you know, prior to COVID, 56% of CUNY Hillel students lacked consistent, reliable food access. I mean, that number is much greater now. And I think for many of these students, they're not sure if they're ever gonna, they're, if they're going to be able to maintain enrollment or and return to college post pandemic. So this is really not a simple calculus for these families. Um, and again, I mean, there's been a lot of emotional distress so, you know, we've spoken with students who have lost four family members over the course of two weeks. These students are unable to grieve and unable to mourn. Um, and 57% of students said, you know, COVID has decreased their ability to do schoolwork. It is, it is a lot of emotional distress and they're lacking community because they're not on campus. They don't have access to faculty. And so, you know, there's just so much fear and anxiety about the unknown, about job prospects, about their own health. and. We also know there's been a lot of discussion about the unequal access to educational resources in the home, technology, connectivity. And so again, I, it just, the, you can, I can't um, underscore enough this, the mental health needs that we're seeing with these students. Um, I, can, I, can, I can stop there, I mean, unless it's helpful. I'll, let me stop there. Yeah, no, Sarah, I mean, so I asked you to paint a picture and um, you, you absolutely did. Um, I think it's very helpful to hear all of those Specifics, Danielle. I mean, you're in Queens, still in New York, um, a different, a different, a different part um, uh, of the world from where many um, who watch live. But we want to sort of start with some really um, clear focus on the New York area, and then Adam will bring us to South Florida um, for sort of a different perspective. But um, but tell us more about Queens and how things how things are right now. Sure. So. First and foremost, Common Point is hyper-focused in the borough of Queens, but when it comes to college persistence, we actually sit in the seven CUNY uh, Hillels doing support employment assistance and supportive services to really help a student be successful and stay enrolled uh, ideally full-time for the four years of school. I think as many people across the country know, Queens was the epicenter of coronavirus and the reality and some of the stats you noted about our need to pivot and turn on our services is true, which is that, you know, for March through June, if you were running a social service agency in the borough of Queens, it really felt like you were doing disaster relief. And what we noted in these students and Sarah did a phenomenal job, like every stat she just, um, she just provided you. I was like, darn, that was one of my stats, but you know, the reality is, is you had an incredibly pressured system already. So Common Point Queens actually started their business of college students in the, in the business of college access. And what we, what we were really interested in is working with Jewish students who were first generation to get into school. And what we quickly noted was that access wasn't enough, success was where we needed to be at, and that we could with the socioeconomics of these families, get many students into schools and get many students funded in schools because they are very much um, living in poverty and therefore there were supports that we could put around them, but we could not get them to be successful in school because as first generation students, without having a presence in the school, there were so many pressures within the household that distracted them from the business of school, which I think is something 
that is really hard um, to wrap your head around when you close your eyes and you think about that college student, because like Sarah said, the CUNY college student is 90 minutes each way on the train, is shuffling a job, is, is playing some role in their household, for the most part are commuting. Um, they have reported, as, as she noted, that they're food insecure. They have reported prior to COVID, 33% of the population was, was reporting depression and anxiety. What we noted post COVID as we started to engage with families was that nothing shocking here is that when you're living one paycheck away from crisis and a global pandemic hits, and we're now five months into that global pandemic, you're, you're beyond crisis. You're in, you're in, in a full tailspin as a family. And so the CUNY student, how do you support them to stay in school while supporting the instability of the household. And so we've worked with students both in emergency cash assistance loans. We've worked with students to support them to finish spring semester because as crazy as this sounds, I'll give you a story. We had a student, Anna, she's 19, a sophomore in college. She lives in a, in a two bedroom apartment with nine family members. Grandparents are there. She sleeps on a couch. COVID hits, Anna loses her study place. So Anna typically stayed on Baruch's campus studying in the library after school, finding quiet spots in the Hillel. As, and Sarah knows that there's not really quiet spots in the Hillel, but much more quiet than nine family members. She gets relegated to, a, you know, to the dining room table where all the other family members are doing their work and their business, didn't have technology access. We had to loan technology to her, didn't have an ability to organize her, her study space. Mom lost employment. Sarah's balancing a job. Mom asks for her to increase hours and really helping Sarah to negotiate supporting and feeding her family with staying in school. And when you think about the average American college student, you're not thinking about a student who's worried that their 15, 19 hour part-time job at the mall is paying for the milk on the table. And I think that that is the reality of the students that we're working with in the Hillels, in the CUNYs in particular. And our goal and, and the way that we need to wrap our, our arms around the problem is really to figure out the supports that help to stabilize that household so that this economic lever of mobility can stay in movement so that that student, I mean, one of our big, um, one of the big impact stats that we track is keeping students fully enrolled, right? Because we know that the second a student drops to part-time status, they've decreased their likelihood of graduating within even six years time. And so for us, we work really hard with students on how do we support students to stay full-time enrolled. I think the other piece that maybe Sarah didn't mention that we're seeing a lot is a lot of our seniors who are on track to jobs, well, when everything halted in economy, where were the first and easiest layoffs were all of these jobs for you know September or July. And so we found a lot of students who we had worked with heartbreakingly hard. Uh, I had a student who was placed in Nickelodeon with a job and you know, lost that position immediately. And again, the socioeconomics of the household dependent dependency on that this student was no longer going to be a dependent um, and to work to find immediate summer employment to help to help them to kind of hold on to finish school as well as use our network, because I think that's the other piece of this is that funders like Sarah, funders like UJA help community-based organizations like us to create networks for students because when you really think about your own child and how they might find their first job, it's you picking up a phone and calling your friend who happens to work in a law firm. Would you mind if Jacob tries out, you know, the firm for a summer? So we become that network for our students. So we were able to help this student who lost her job at Nickelodeon connect through our network and get placed in not her dream job, but her first job that will help her to move forward. And I think that that's another piece of this is that when you're 
socioeconomics are where they are and you're a first generation student, you don't have a fallback plan and you don't have a network of family, friends that are gonna tie you over while the tornado is spinning. And so I think when you're thinking about what is happening in a post global pandemic to these college students is incredible levels of anxiety, stress and depression, right? Because why is it so hard for me? Like I've done everything right in my life. I've been a good student. Thank God CUNY system is providing a really top notch education for students who lean into it. Why does this have to be so hard for me? And now this, right? So there's the anxiety of that and our job is to really support those students to manage their anxiety, to provide them with the supports to be able to focus and, and, and re-matriculate into school in the fall, to help them come up with solutions on how that's possible in their already stressed home environments, um, and to really support them with the, you know, to remove the barriers of the technology barrier, of the fact that we had households that we had to help actually turn on internet because it wasn't a need because the student was getting that done through staying on campus and how you really think about all the things all of the assumptions we make about our our own lives and again i'm making assumptions on this webinar so i apologize for that um is the things that we can't assume that these students have and how do we help them to identify those barriers ahead of time so that we can really support them through their academic journey is really the role that we're playing on these campuses when traditionally the role that we were playing was really employment, career counseling, um, internship placement, and through the foundation, the Jewish Foundation for the Education of Women, we actually support students with stipends each semester, as well as a, a bridge summer of, of employment. I think what's interesting to note on that, and then I'll stop unless you want me to continue, is we just graduated our first cohort. The goal in order to get the stipend was that the student had to stay fully matriculated and they had to participate in this summer internship. Of our first cohort, 80% of our students are graduating within four years. That's a staggering statistic. CUNY graduation rate, I think, is 12% four years, 43% six years. And so it shows that when you lean in and you support these students with financial resources and not an overabundance, but just enough to take the pressure off of a full-time job, managing a full-time job while trying to go to school at night, and you provide them with a meaningful summer internship placement, you have just in that minor intervention tripled the four-year graduation rate of the of that cohort compared to what is the CUNY graduation rates, which I think is probably something that we as an agency are incredibly proud to note and really shows that the intervention works and where the intervention didn't work. Um, by August, we'll have 90% of those students graduated. And with the exception of one health condition and one student who unmatriculated due to moving, I think that says something really meaningful about where we need to show up for our college students and how we need to show up for them. So I thought, I hope that this kind of helped um, allow it. No, thank you, Danielle. And you sort of bring the, again, on the ground perspective to, to um, complement Sarah's perspective. So very helpful. Um, so we're going to move to South Florida. Adam, um, you know, a lot of people look at New York and say, well, that's Sounds interesting, but that's New York. We're not anything like New York. Most people are nobody like, nothing like New York. So um, as somebody who was born and raised in the Midwest, um, I'm always looking for people who do not live in New York and want to give us their perspective on, on what it looks like from your perspective. So, so tell us a little bit about, about what you're seeing and, and what's changing um, in South Florida. Sure, and, and thank you so very much, Susan, for, for having us and, and Hillel and, and Danielle and Sarah. I am equal parts intimidated and inspired from, from hearing your, your remarks and sitting on a panel with you and, and, and learned an awful lot. Uh, Florida is, is certainly different than, than what you're hearing some of in, in New York, not necessarily in, in the cases of need, but aside from you know, some of the Israeli and Latin immigrants in, in Florida, we, we have a, uh, 
an American-based community and a community that's been living in the United States for a number of generations. But you know, where where I'll get my comments around to is is the the that doesn't necessarily mean less need. It's just a, a different sense of need. Uh, so you know, I think when I say Jews in Florida. Uh, you know, what do people think of? And, and obviously, you know, here in, in the Palm Beaches, it trends higher than the average American community in the Bubby and Zadie market. Uh, but our demographics have changed dramatically over the last decade. And, and we're earning our nickname as the sixth borough, at least in the Palm Beaches. You've had wealthy and working class Jews alike, and not just their grandparents, flocking to Palm Beach, looking for relief from higher taxes and a, and a different style of life. So slightly south of the Palm Beaches, you have Broward and Miami-Dade counties. And there you've got a, a more rooted Jewish family community, not quite as uh, new to the area. But the range of income that you'll find uh, throughout Florida is just astounding. Uh, something that's important to, to stay here that isn't any different than New York, but it's very easy to be Jewish here. Our intermarriage rate is lower than the national average. That's aided by the fact that our Jewish population is, is huge in comparison to the rest of the country, not New York. One out of three residents in South Palm Beach County are Jewish. So the percentage is not quite as dramatic as that 33% in North Palm Beach and in Broward and in Miami-Dade, but it's not hard to find fresh hummus, a decent deli, or a catered kugel anywhere around here. So I think this huge Jewish population translates obviously into a ton of Jewish college students each and every year. There's great wealth in Florida, but the children of my Hillel's donor base, they largely don't go to school in state. So we're talking about uh, a, a different uh, class of, of Jewish college student. Um, so there's approximately 20,000 Jewish students that are studying at public Florida State, uni, uni, at public universities in the state of Florida right now. So you can see the scale that we're talking about. This population growth is not all uh, go able able to both afford or get into the University of Florida or Florida State. That's, that's not been the case for quite a while. So you have local and commuter campuses in Florida that are playing a, a major role, like my campus of Florida Atlantic or others in Orlando, South Miami, and in Tampa. These schools are a little easier to get into, they're a little bit cheaper, and in most cases students can live and do live at home while they're attending. Some of our students have severe financial limitations. I'm not just, you know, I'm, I'm gonna try to juxtapose between the typical struggling college student that's concerned about their financial future. I think you'll find that at every campus across the country. Uh, but no, I'm really referring to students who work full-time jobs and then some while they're in school and, and they need serious jobs, right? Minimum wage doesn't cut it. So they're managing a Dunkin' Donuts or they're trying to, to find positions that are gonna pay them better than that minimum wage uh, because they really need those resources. Uh, the, a lot of them build up tremendous debt. Most of them do it without making the appropriate financial decisions. They get little guidance or advice at home. And I guess you know, some of this might be similar to what we were hearing about, but, but their families just don't have the connections or the know-how to help their children hop up a few rungs on that ladder. At least they know that going to college is a good thing and, and, and it helps, but, but so much uh, of what we achieve as a community happens because of that networking and because of the guidance that we're able to give our, our students. And a lot of these parents, they're just working hard themselves. A lot of single parents, we do have a large number of immigrants, not like what we heard about in New York. Uh, and, and, and we have not a small number of first generation college students. So, so these students are struggling with serious bills that represent the basics of life. Plenty of students help out with money at home from their work. And, and, and we each year hear of students that, that we learn about that are living out of their cars, that are couch surfing, that are apartment hopping, uh, and, and, and these are for a, a plethora of different reasons. A, a few years ago, my board and I decided that we needed a full-time campus rabbi on our team, and, and this was for a number of reasons. And, and you can probably imagine our students keep her busy. She's, she's wonderful. Uh, and she's often the staff member that, that will inform me of, of a student that needs some support from our community. And here we're fortunate to be able to call upon family services and that network. Now, now I'll tell you, most of the time in the most dire of situations, we, we find that our students, even with our help, and, and we do everything that we can, they simply don't follow through with the necessary intake that, that the family service agencies have established. This is due to mental health challenges. Anxiety is such a debilitating disease right now for our college students. 
that uh, you know they, they simply don't follow through with things that would be helpful for them in many situations. Now, I, I don't have as much qualitative data from across the state as, as would be nice in this situation. I can certainly tell you that, that one to two percent, easily two to three hundred of those Jewish students are facing serious financial challenges of the life that we're talking. And of course, it's a continuum. So, so many, many, many more students have serious financial challenges or just are not getting that leg up that a college education could be providing them because they're not taking advantage of everything that they could be. Uh, now, now, as far as this year goes, we know, as we've heard, it's going to be worse. We've already had some student leaders that were active and involved in our Hillel and had roles for this year, and they came to us and, and they hung their heads and they had to tell us they have to drop out. They have to get a job full time. They're not going to be able to dedicate time to what they need to do for themselves and for their family and for school and still be involved in Hillel. Uh, a lot of them have parents who have lost jobs, and of course, our students jobs themselves, their positions were the first to be cut. We've already heard that. Um, I'll spend just a, a minute on how our Hillel does provide some support to, to our most vulnerable of students. And, and then we can maybe move on to, to some questions. So, so I already mentioned the, 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 the pastoral and another support that our staff gives. And I think that we can't underestimate these one-on-one -on -one connections that Hillel professionals make with our students. It's the only thing that makes the students comfortable to talk about their challenges. We uh, are able to refer them out and up and, and to connect them because of these relationships that we have. So, you know, uh, I, I think all nonprofits talk about the fact that their, their budget is their people, you know, but, but it's all the more so at Hilla. When we don't have enough professionals on our team, if we can't uh, hire enough uh, staff to make these personal relationships with students, there's so much less that we'll ever be able to do. Um, of course, we nourish our students. We've maintained programming since, uh, since uh, March where, where we're still providing students with vouchers in order to, 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 to purchase food. So we'll give them a Grubhub or a, or a local chain restaurant uh, gift certificate for, uh, for, for participating in programming, not so much to incentivize them to join the programs, though it doesn't hurt, but really because we know they need the help to get fed. Uh, we also have stipend-based programs. This is how a lot of our students tell us they can join in on these programs. They're, they're 10 sessions or so, you know, we're roughly paying them 10 bucks an hour. It's not a ton of money, but it's what our students are sacrificing by coming to Hillel to learn about Jewish life and to connect to Jewish community. We feel like it's a tiny price to pay. Uh, we also have a, a program that we're fond of, and, and our students are as well, called Career Accelerator. And, and we're lucky in South Florida that we have an awful lot of, of retired, uh, successful uh, business folks and, and, and professionals that are want to and willing to give time back to college students to help them get a leg up. When we can convince our students to take advantage of, of this incredible resource, uh, it, it, it helps uh, on both sides. It helps the, the, the donor base become energized and excited about being able to really help and make a difference in the life of one person at a time. Uh, and, and of course, it's helpful for our students. I already talked about the fact that they just can't get this kind of support at, at home. So, uh, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll end with that and, and turn it back to yeah. you, Susan. No, this is, um, it's great to hear sort of that, that perspective on things um, and some of the ways that you're able to help the community um, kind of connect um, as well as provide um, those important sort of networking and, and other supports to, to the students. So I'd like to do a couple things. One is um, there is a, something in the Q&A, um, uh, which I'll read out in a moment. And then I'd like to give um, an opportunity for our panelists to just ask each other questions. Um, you each are looking at this from a slightly different camera angle. Um, so let me start by reading out the, um, the Q&A from Liz Cantor Gross kind of about Mazon. Um, and I'll just read it out, which is that Mazon is keen to ensure that students, be they school age um, or in college, have enough to eat. And they're working to increase visibility on college hunger as a growing problem uh, locally and nationally um, and ensure that low-income children have access to school lunch um, without shame or stigma. And there are sort of a number of, of other um, data points in here, which um, maybe we can post tomorrow afterwards. Um, so, so thank you for that. And um, the website that um, she cited was mazon.org, M-A-Z-O-N. So why don't we um, move to uh, just a little bit of discussion. I would love to 
ask, what did you hear in each other's stories? What resonated? What, um, what did you learn? What are you, what are you curious about? I, I, I can jump in and, and Danielle, I think at some point you re I mean, a, a number of points, but you really hit the nail on the head for me where you said that we have to identify barriers ahead of time because, you know, we're at Hillel, it, it, a lot of what we do is reactive and, and it's once the student's already presenting and they've already dug themselves into this tremendous financial hole that, that they should and could have been counseled out of, or I, I don't know how we do that, but, but that is, is key. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in kind of straddling the college access and the college success world, we've really seen that one of, I think, our roles in this process is it's the moment in time where a young person is learning how to advocate for themselves. And that is a really hard time when I, as right, an 18-year-old lean in and ask for help. And when this is just, I got to put my big boy, big girl pants on and solve it myself. And so I think we as the adults around college students have to figure out how we make that easier. So, you know, my zone's comment on SNAP benefits, how we as a social service agency who provides screening leans into the college student and says, attend this workshop, or if you need this kind of information or, you know, a Calendly so that it's a one-on-one -on -one appointment because that might be the right way to provide that type of resource, how you destigmatize mental health so that people do not suffer in silence. And when you get into the ethnic communities of our Hillels, I think you see that more because you really have to destigmatize for the family that it is okay to need help. And when you start to, especially in the CUNYs, and Sarah, you could jump in if you agree or disagree, get into the religiosity of the family and the gender role and how that plays in what a young woman thinks, feels, or wants for herself and how you as the social service provider really, really balance respect for cultural identity and religious observation with it's 2020 and how do I help you to embrace all of this opportunity if that is what you as an adult are choosing for yourself. And so I think you're absolutely right, Adam, like that is probably one of my golden nuggets of like, how do we get ahead of this before that student is meeting with our financial counselor because they took a year off and now they have debt on top of debt. And of course they passed the student union and applied for that credit card because they got a free t-shirt and they've, right, they've started to dig themselves in a hole and you're trying to help them figure out how to, but, but that piece, right, has lasting imprints for many years to come. And so if we as adults around these students can get, can get involved sooner, I think the better. And I, and, and I couldn't agree more. And, and I think, you know, kudos to you for figuring out ways to put carrots for students to be able to have permission to be students. Because I think that for me, as a caring adult who watches is the hardest part when you look at that college student who's balancing three jobs commutes, responsibilities to younger siblings. When you give them permission to sit and have Jewish identity as a part of their day because they can justify it with a stipend, it's really just the excuse to be a kid. And that's, I think, the other piece that all of us should think more creatively about is how do we provide these students with opportunities to experience some moments of relief and some moments of joy when there is really so much on their shoulders. Um, Sarah, I'd love to hear what you think about that as it relates from the, from the foundation perspective of kind of balancing college success with the college experience. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot of nuggets here to weigh in on, so thank you, thank you both. I mean, I, I think just to underscore what what you what you both are saying that I, I think yes you need to get in front and try to have a an understanding of what these barriers are and to address those because I think what we're realizing is a place like Hillel you know is typically a place where you explore your Jewish identity and have these experiences but I think in in your community Adam as well as what Danielle and I are seeing at the CUNYs it is so much more than that um, it is both a place to explore new types of Jewish identity, because also, as Danielle was describing, you know, there are also, and I had said at the outset, there really are um, 
it's a real range in terms of the religious experience of students that are attending these CUNYs. There are a lot of ultra-Orthodox, there are some that are modern Orthodox, and they are deeply rooted, especially in their home, um, in these traditions. And so what's exciting about Hillel, and I think such an important thing that they provide, is a space where they can take something like where they can really start to grapple with very tough questions that they might experience, be experiencing at this phase in their life um, and tie that to Jewish value and text in a way that they might not be doing at home. And so it really, you know, I think that's such an important role. But even beyond that, you know, what I think these Hillels are tasked to do is really both provide opportunities to, you know, assess students' basic needs, make sure that they are being met, provide support. And as you were saying, Adam, the staff are just so key. I think oftentimes as funders, and I said this to somebody yesterday, you know, are always sort of looking at kind of the next big thing and the big innovation, and that is really important. But I feel like especially now, given everything that is happening in the world, you know, the students $500 in their pocket. Um, and check in with them and make sure they're okay and make sure they haven't lost a family member. Make sure they're doing okay because they haven't had the time to grieve in the way that they normally would have. I mean, it's all of these pieces and we need to make sure that you most likely lost your minimum wage job that you're still finding ways in this virtual environment to develop skills, to build networks, to build your brand. Because I think one thing we're also hearing over and over, and I think some of the things that we've been surprised and really have applauded seeing through the foundation lens is where we see some of these Hillel directors that we work closely with really say like, okay, we are gonna find a way to help provide these students because they, with these opportunities, even in a virtual environment, because they need to feel like they're moving forward. We all do. I mean, we have moments where we're waking up and it feels like Groundhog Day. We're in the same office, we're doing the same thing, we're on Zoom all day long. And so, you know, imagine then that you didn't have a job and you're a graduating senior and how do you feel like you can move forward? And so I think any of those opportunities where students are taking virtual internships are, you know, getting involved um, to provide tutoring or any, any other service I think is really, really meaningful. Um, but again, I, I just think the, these CUNY Hills are tasked and it sounds, again, as you said, Adam, too, are with so much, with addressing these basic needs, making sure college is both enriching and thought-provoking, but then, you know, that it's, it positions these students for success, that they do, you know, get the services and support they need to graduate, and that to propel them into a living wage job, they need it for themselves, they need it for their families, um, and it's a lot. And, and I will say, you know, I think one of the other things that really stands out to me is that you know, when we look across the CUNY Hillels that Danielle and I, you know, both work with, I mean, they are spending between 158 to say $275 per student a year. And then when you look at some of the other New York area Hillels, it's usually between $547 and $1,781. I mean, that is just that is astounding. And so I just, you know, given the need, given that we're all that we're asking, you know, these clubs essentially on campus to provide, they just, they, they, they need more funding to do it. And so again, Adam, I applaud that I know you are wearing a multiple hats as well as everyone on your team. Is. It's something that I really admire and appreciate so much. Yeah. Absolutely. And there are a couple of questions in the chat as well about, you know, would, uh, would love to hear more about the use of retired folks to help students um, and a question about whether Hillel provides job opportunities um, from childcare to yard work or anything else. So Adam, I don't know if you want to pick that one up. We have about 10 minutes left. So um, I sort of want to be mindful of that as well. Sure, I can, I can answer quickly. Um, what, what we've, we, we haven't found extraordinarily success with, with pairing up students with mentors uh, for different reasons, whether the student drops the ball or the mentor gets busy. Uh, but, but where we do have success is where we bring speakers onto campus for our students. And, and, and that often uh, starts a relationship between a student, a smart student that goes up and, and does the networking that we've taught them to do up until that point in our program. Uh, and actually begins to build a relationship with the retiree themselves. And we've had a number of 
of great relationships start that way. So we'll have on-campus programs where we'll bring, you know, five, 10 different speakers or, you know, table captains, uh, retirees that can talk about professions. When we do it well, we break it up by profession if our students even know which profession they want to go and, and, and learn about yet at that point. Uh, Hillel, uh, we, we thought about getting into the job placement business, but it's not where we need to be. Uh, it's really onerous and time consuming. And then, you know, you have uh, Jewish employers that get frustrated because you sent them not a great employee. And it, family services in some communities does that. And in others, it's, it's the job board for, for the universities. Uh, we post stuff that comes our way and students need to take the initiative and, and uh, you know, avail themselves of that. And, and I don't know exactly where to throw in this topic, so I'm just gonna throw it out there because I'm hearing both from Danielle and Sarah just this tremendous grit, for lack of a better way to put it, that we know that first generation and immigrant families have. Um, sometimes I bemoan a lack of, of that grit of, of some of our students and, and don't know exactly how to best incentivize them. You know, we're in Florida, it's a little sun kiss down here in some cases, but, but you know, they're, you know, and I know that we, we can't push uh, young adults further than they want to be pushed themselves, but, but uh, time and again, and a lot of it is due to their circumstances they're coming with, we, we find that our students aren't always taking advantage of all the opportunities they could be. So I'm going to, do you mind if I jump in and just give a different lens? So I think, you know, one of the things that's super interesting about this moment in time and, you know, my role in agency is, is the, the, reality of need for strategic alliances and strategic partnerships. Not everybody should be expert in everything. And so for us, my role as a social service agency in the Seven Hillels is to be the employer counselor because that's what I do um, back, back at the ranch. I was trying to think of a better term, but back at the ranch. And so instead of Adam having to go and cultivate jobs, cultivating a relationship with me where my employee, employee counselor sits on these CUNY campuses in that role allows for us to work in partnership with the executive directors to create the synergy where we can provide a resource and a service and obviously grateful for the funding that UJA provides and the network that it provides that, that tries to sync up services so that we don't have to be, the Hillel doesn't have to be expert in all things. And we stop where the Hill, right? So Jewish identity, that's, that is where our Hillel execs, they're gonna, their, their program and focus is gonna be on. And where we come in is really into support into the employment space. Adam made a really good point. One of the things that again, makes this strategic alliance really interesting is so then UJA as our funder, we turn to them and say, okay, let's talk about your emerging leaders, which is their 20 somethings. Nobody said lovingly about all 20 somethings they love to talk about themselves and like it's one of the things that they can meaningfully do in volunteer work and so we set up lots of coffee chats where emerging leaders that UJA has helped us to identify sit with our Hillel students and talk about you want to be a lawyer well there's 50 different ways that that can manifest here's a real estate attorney here's here's you know securities litigation here's here's you know corporate defense why don't you ask some meaningful questions and 100% it's then our job to really prepare that student to lean into that moment and take advantage of the fact that they just had coffee with somebody. And that's how you teach a student whose family doesn't know how to network, how to network. And so I think in this moment in time for the student resources are sparse, but so are for the social service agencies and the Hillels to figure out how funders can think through creating partnerships that are meaningful where not everybody has to be the expert in the room but takes the expertise that everybody has so that we can get ahead of the problems is something that we all need to probably spend more time thinking about creatively i think it's not in all of our inclinations and first instincts to partner but i think if we all want to be here in 15 to 20 years partnerships and strategic alliances will be critical to that space and so Sorry for jumping in, Adam, but I just thought I could offer a different perspective. No, that's that's terrific, and um, and we're sort of just at the last five minutes. I think this 
um, way to end is a really powerful um, sort of way to go forward as well. Um, so I'd love it if each of you wants to take a minute and think about um, if there was a headline for you that came out of this hour um, or, or a takeaway, um, that would be helpful. I think for me, there was there were two. One was about, and Danielle, you mentioned joy um, and really giving people just a break, giving people, giving students a chance to be students just for a few minutes, um, even if it's, you know, the reality is, um, is so challenging. Um, and sort of the notion, the second one um, was sort of the notion of, of grit and, and how much are we expecting of the students, right? And so if you, all of the work in systemic racism, all of the work that we know about systemic inequity, it puts so much um, on the, the child, on the student, um, on the family to, um, through grit, pluck, resilience, you know, kind of pull themselves up by their bootstraps when in fact <clears throat> there are huge systemic um, issues at every sort of step of the way, every door um, that you all have mentioned um, is, is closed. And so I just, I really appreciate this conversation and some of the places just to round out not only our perspective about about what's needed, but even again, just sort of as we got to towards the end, you know, you know, can strategic alliances play a better role? Can we, you know, how, how do we do, um, how do we serve this, these students as well as we possibly can? Um, and there was a chat question, um, which might be one of my favorites of all time now, which is, um, can JFN please publish a list of relevant charities to support in this space? Um, so one thing that, just to preview this fall a little bit, one thing that we'll be doing this fall is start to think about where are investable opportunities um, in each of these spaces um, that Tamar mentioned, we have set, we've done seven webinars. Um, and so as we sort of launch into the fall, I think it'd be really helpful. Um, it's not a pitch to anyone, but it's just more to get a sense of what are bright spots, what are beacons, what are great, um, the, what are the kinds of things that we should be investing in um, more ambitiously so that um, for sure a day-to-day -day, um, struggle, grit, resilience is so important um, and, and helping them with those challenges, but also kind of attacking, while also, I should say, attacking um, sort of the bigger, the bigger systemic issues. So I want to say thank you to the three of you um can you give us um a bit of a a bit of a headline um in our last couple of minutes anything that sort of stuck with you no i yeah i just i think it's really important i think it's very easy um to just to just think of the jewish you know college student population in a very monolithic way and i hope that we have you know made very clear that it is it is not uh, the way I think many of us typically perceive it. It is, you know, there are multiple ethnicities. There is richness in terms of diversity. There are, you know, upwards of 10% Jews of color. Like our community is 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 diverse and vast and rich and, and also struggling, you know, there. And, and so I think there is more that we need to do to lift these members of our community up. And I will say, you know, one of the reasons the foundation is really invested in, you know, this community in New York City. I mean, these CUNY students, this this is the future Jewish population of New York City. This is, we are reliving the story of these families who are here and trying to make a better life. They have lots of first, you know, they're first generation college students. There's so much more that we can do, and it does not require a lot of money. Again, many people, you know, end up supporting a lot of these other, you know, very elite universities, and that is wonderful and important. But there, you know, in my backyard, uh, many of our own backyards, there is such tremendous need. Give a small portion of that to these students because, again, you're both for lifetime success and also our Jewish community. I think, similarly, to piggyback off of Sarah, when you're in college, college student this is the first moment in time where you finally begin to be in the driver's seat of your future and you're really in control. So as a person who runs an agency that provides his services from, we crassly say, cradle to grave, this is a particular moment in time where a student is starting to lean into themselves. And so for, for Jewish identity, for joy, for impact, the investment that you can make and the strategic alliances that you can create are really very unique and special. And I think when looking at CUNYs in particular and looking at what the Jewish community of the future looks like, it isn't anything you assume. And I think amazingly that Sarah's visited the Hillel's. I think that that is the most 
interesting part of New York City is, 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 as I said it earlier, is you have to remove every assumption that you have and recognize that, that as, a, as a community supporting members who are in need, that there is a way to support this group, both for Jewish identity as well as future impact, where you can turn a lever on and really make life long changes and, and ultimately change the trajectory of a family. And so I think strategic alliances, partnerships, and investing in the grit that we see in these students will be key to the future of the Jewish community. Absolutely. So we're just at time, actually a minute over, but Adam, if you have a, a sentence that you want to give us before Tamar uh, leaves us out. I put it in a tweet. You said so, Susan. So oh. the, the, the more we can position students for success in a supportive environment, the stronger our community will be. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you to all three of you. Thank you for the work you do every day supporting these students. Thank you for being here and sharing your, your insights um, on, a, on an August uh, afternoon. Um, so Tamar, um, back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan, for moderating so wonderfully for your partnership throughout all of these briefings this, this summer. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Sarah, also for highlighting this a bunch of months ago, coming to us and telling us, like, let's dive deeper into higher education and, and the needs of, of people out there in the community. So thank you for that. Um, really appreciate all of you that have participated. We're looking forward to doing more in the fall. So look out for emails regarding different opportunities to learn and convene together. And with that, I wanna wish everybody a safe, safe and healthy day and rest of your summer. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you, have a good day.